or maybe the baby just came off CPAP and so you're no longer weighing the baby with that much equipment even though we try not to obviously there's always something kind of hanging on hello and welcome for the first time to Tala Talks NICU or welcome back to Tala Talks NICU where we take complicated medical concepts and make them really easy for you to understand and hopefully become a better clinician. So many of you have asked us to run a series of videos on fluid and electrolytes. So this video is the first video in the series. Honestly, at this point, we're pretty much choosing which subject to film based on your request. So if there's something that you really want to watch, then please let us know below. So as an introduction to fluids and electrolytes, I'm going to go over nine basic facts, completely random number, that you really need to understand as kind of the fundamentals before we go on to more complicated concepts. The first one is expected weight loss in the first week of life. All babies, whether they're premature or term, are born with excess fluid, mostly extracellular fluid. And so a healthy baby will pee out or will urinate out that excess fluid in the first few days of life. And so we would expect a healthy baby, whether it's term or preterm, to lose a percentage of their birth weight. Generally, we expect a loss up to about 10% of their birth weight. If babies lose significantly more than that, then it could mean that they're slightly dehydrated and we may have to intervene. If it's a tiny 24 weeker, it may need that they may need more fluids. If it's a term baby who's being exclusively breastfed, then maybe they're just not getting enough volume and they need to be supplemented, whether it's from donor breast milk or with formula feeds. So a healthy baby though would be expected to lose weight in the first few days of life. The second point is about the extraordinary energy and fluid reserves that a healthy term baby has. In fact, a healthy term baby can fully survive and function on just really a few drops of the mother's breast milk every few hours for the first couple of days of life. Because as you all know, that's normally how long it takes for the breast milk to come in. Most of the time, these babies do have the reserve to wait for mother's breast milk to come in, whether that takes two or three days. But if a baby has any other risk factors, for example, their large for gestational age, small for gestational age, an infant of a diabetic mother, or they're premature, then that baby may not have the reserves that it needs to be able to sustain itself and produce the energy that it needs to. So if a baby does have risk factors, then generally or possibly that baby may need further supplementation or may become hypoglycemic and need a glucose gel or IV fluids or supplementation with a formula. The third concept is that you should understand the importance of glycogen. Glycogen is stored in the liver and is used as the energy source for babies. So when glycogen breaks down, it breaks down into glucose. And the synthesis of glycogen increases continuously throughout pregnancy and then kind of peaks right at the end of pregnancy. So kind of right at the end of the third trimester. If a baby is small for gestational age or uh, has IUGR, then that baby is likely to have a smaller liver and have less glycogen in the liver. Same thing if the baby is premature, the baby will be smaller anyway, so will have less glycogen in the liver, but also will lose that important last kind of few weeks of the third trimester where they're really building up the glycogen in the liver. So for an SGA baby or a premature baby, the glycogen stores will run out much more rapidly. And so that's one of the reasons why these babies may need an external energy source, whether again, like I keep saying, fluids or donor breast milk, or glucose gel or whatever. The fourth concept you need to understand is the surface area over to volume ratio of babies. So the smaller the baby, the higher the surface area over volume ratio. Why is this important and why are we even talking about maths here? Because it is such an important concept, I'm going to kind of belabor this point a bit. Okay, so let's go over an example. Think of two cubes. One is two centimeters around each edge cubed, and the other is three centimeters. So let's calculate the surface area over volume ratio for both of these cubes. For, so for the two centimeter cubed, the surface area is two by two, that's the 
area obviously of one side which is four centimeters times by six because the cube has six sides so 24 centimeters squared and the volume is two times two times two which is eight centimeters cubed so the surface area over the volume ratio for the two centimeter cubed is three now what about for the three centimeters cubed now let's go over the surface area over volume ratio of the three centimeter cubed cube so the surface area is three by three which is nine centimeters times six which is 54 centimeters and the volume is three times three which is nine times three which is 27 centimeters cubed so the surface area over volume ratio is 54 divided by 27 which is two so again the larger the cube the smaller the surface area over the volume ratio or the smaller the baby, then the higher the surface area over volume ratio. Or another way of saying it, going back to the babies, the smaller the baby, then relatively more of the baby's skin is exposed to the outside world. And the more skin that's exposed to the outside world, the higher the insensible losses. So what are insensible losses? Insensible losses are fluid lost from the body through the skin or through mucous membranes. Most of the time it's through the lungs, which is why, by the way, if you're talking nonstop, you can get really dehydrated because that's kind of one of the times where you might lose a lot of fluid through your lungs. Normally, the skin is a much higher component of the insensible losses. In a newborn baby, about two thirds of the insensible losses happens through the skin and about a third happens out of the lungs. And like we said, the smaller the baby, relatively, the higher the skin exposure to the outside world and their skin is just a lot thinner as well. So the smaller the baby, the higher the insensible water losses, especially through their skin. We try to minimize that as much as possible. For example, as soon as they're born, we put them in the plastic wrap. So to prevent as much evaporation as possible, once we get them to the NICU, we put them in the isolate or the incubator, normally with some amount of humidity, again, to try to decrease those insensible water losses. Insensible losses are really the main reason why the smaller the baby, the higher the fluid volume that they may need at the beginning of their lives. So a term baby, if they're admitted to the NICU, and so obviously they're a bit sick, they're not just hanging out with their mother in couplet care, would need somewhere between 50 to 70 mLs per kilo per day. A 30 weeker may need 70 to 90 mLs per kilo per day. And a 24 weeker may need 90 to 120 mLs per kilo per day. Again, this, a lot of this is because of the increased insensible losses in the smaller babies. The fifth concept is the fact that all babies are not born ready to eat all the calories or nutrition that it will eventually need. So really they build up to this over the first few days of life. If for example, you fed a full term healthy baby two ounces of formula or milk or donor breast milk or anything, then that baby will most likely vomit it up just because their stomach is too small and their intestines just can't tolerate that volume. So it takes a little bit of time, really several days, even for a term baby to build up to that volume of feeds they need to perform all their metabolic functions as well as to grow. Since a lot of premature babies, especially those born at less than 34 weeks, are not eating readily by mouth, so they're not taking PO and we're actually having to gavage them, how long they take to reach full feeds will kind of depend on how quickly you advance their feeds. So generally, the smaller the baby, the longer it will take them to get to full feeds. So maybe a 33, 34 weeker will get there in five, six days, and a 24 weeker may get there in seven to 14 days, depending on what your unit does and how quickly you advance feeds. The sixth concept is the massive importance that we place on baby's growth. We're pretty obsessed with how well babies are growing. Most NICUs weigh babies every single day and they'll measure the head circumference and the length once a week, unless there are other concerns. As a kind of rough estimate, a baby's length 
in the NICU, so a lot of preterm babies, should be increasing by between 0.8 and 1 centimeter a week. And a baby's head circumference, if they have natural brain growth, should be between 0.5 and 0.8 centimeters a week. Obviously, it's not just about fattening up the babies, though. We want the babies to grow so that their organs and their systems can heal. We want the lungs to grow really as normally as possible. And for that, they need very good nutrition. We also know that growth, good growth in the NICU, correlates really closely with neurodevelopmental outcomes. In fact, a study showed that if a baby grows 21 grams per kilo per day, as opposed to 12 grams per kilo per day, then those babies that grew at a higher rate were much less likely to have bad neurodevelopmental outcomes as well as cerebral palsy. So good growth is extremely important. I just want to mention a small caveat here. Even though we are obsessed with weights, and yes, we do weigh the babies every day, generally we should be following those weights over kind of several days because there are so many things that cause little variations in the day-to-day -day weights. For example, say the baby urinated, had a wet diaper right before the baby was weighed at three o'clock in the morning or whatever. Maybe that wet diaper was 20 mLs, which is basically 20 grams. And so for example, that day, it looked like the baby hadn't gained weight. Really, we wanted the baby to gain about 20 grams. And then maybe the next day, the baby will gain 50 grams. Or maybe the baby just came off CPAP. And so you're no longer weighing the baby with that much equipment. Even though we try not to, obviously there's always something and kind of hanging on, then that obviously is going to affect the baby's weight. Obviously, there are just variations in, in the beds and sometimes they're not always that precise. And sometimes we have to weigh babies several times in a row because we can't really believe how crazy that number is. So the point of this monologue is that don't just follow the weight of the babies over every day, follow it over several days. That's why as well, you are getting the length only once a week. You're actually following that over kind of a month. Kind of same thing with a head circumference in a healthy baby or following it over several weeks, just because of all the tiny variations that can happen. The seventh point is, is that the way that we are trying to feed premature babies is by providing them the nutrition that they would be receiving in utero. In fact, we actually need to give them a little bit more nutrition or more calories at least than they would be receiving in utero because they're now also responsible for keeping themselves warm as well as for breathing and controlling other bodily functions more effectively. They no longer have the placenta to do the breathing for them but they should still at least be getting the minimum protein and sugars and fats, as well as all the vitamins and minerals the, the mothers would have been giving them through pregnancy. This is actually really, really hard to do. But ultimately we want premature babies growing outside of their mothers in our units, following exactly the same curves that they would be following if those babies were still inside their mothers. So always be sure to plot the weight, the head circumference and the length on the growth curves so that you can actually see whether the infant is following the curves appropriately. And those are pretty steep curves. I mean, this is the largest part of growth in all of human development. And so you can really be tricked. You're actually just looking at the baby's weights every day and it looks like they're gaining weight. You can see the baby get bigger in front of you, but it's very possible that when you plot the weight on the curve, you see that the baby is falling off its curve or the, or the line is kind of just flattening a little bit. So always be sure to plot out all those parameters. The eighth concept is the energy demands of a growing infant. So for a baby to grow, whether they're premature or a term baby, they need somewhere between 100 to 140 calories per kilo per day. Generally, the smaller the infant, the higher the calories is needed. Just like with adults, babies can also have vastly different basal metabolic rates. So some premature infants may grow really well on 100 calories per kilo per day, and other premature babies may need the full 140 calories per kilo per day to grow. Also, just like adults, if anything stressful is happening to the body or we're doing anything stressful on purpose, like for example, running a marathon, or if somebody is really sick and their temperature goes up and they're trying to fight infections, then generally the basal metabolic rate goes up. Same thing with babies, obviously. If the baby has a fever, if the baby's breathing really, really fast, then definitely they're going to need more calories to still make sure that they can grow. And the ninth 
fifth really important concept is the amount of calories in breast milk or baby formula. We estimate that breast milk has 19 to 20 calories per ounce. By the way, an ounce is 30 mLs. Remember that conversion, you're going to use it all the time. We use those two uh, volumes very interchangeably, mLs and ounces. So you know though that sometimes a mother will hand you some milk and sometimes it looks like just kind of like discolored water and sometimes it looks like really, really thick cream. Obviously that really, really thick cream is going to have a lot more calories per ounce. There are really kind of these cool machines that can measure exactly how many calories there are in mother's breast milk. And sometimes they'll show up to 35 calories, maybe even more than that per ounce. Some units actually offer that. They're not always the most accurate though. Term formulas, which obviously are trying to emulate mother's breast milk, also have 19 to 20 calories per ounce or about 66 calories per 100 mLs. That's the direct conversion. Based on the numbers that we've already talked about, if a baby needs 100 calories per kilo per day and the formula has 20 calories per ounce, then let's calculate how many ounces or mLs per kilo that baby has to eat. So 100 calories divided by 20 calories, that baby has to eat five ounces per kilo per day. So five times 30 is 150, so five times 30 is 150 mLs per kilo per day. So for a term baby to get to 100 calories per kilo per day, they have to eat 150 mLs per kilo per day of term formula. Like we said, a preterm baby would need more calories per kilo per day than this. But we don't just want to go all the way up on the volume, they would get fluid overloaded. So what do we do? We either give formula with increased calories per ounce, so a higher concentration of the formula, or we add extra calories to human milk, whether it's donor breast milk or the mother's express milk. And we can do that with either formula or with human milk fortifier. So for example, if we wanted to give 120 calories per kilo per day to a preemie baby and we fed them 150 mLs per kilo per day, then we can do that by giving them 24 cal per ounce formula. And that's very frequently what we do with preemies. Sometimes babies need even more calories than this, or we're even more fluid restricted. And logically, if you go down on the volume that you're giving, but you still want to give calories, then you have to go up on the concentration of the milk. So sometimes we'll go all the way up to 30 calories per ounce, trying to get the calories that these babies need. And that was it. Nine random, very important concepts that you need to understand as kind of like the fundamentals for fluids and electrolytes. So stay tuned. There's going to be a lot more videos on feeds, how to increase feeds or how different institutions increase feeds, as well as TPN and just all the various electrolyte abnormalities that we see very routinely. In the meantime, please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And please let us know what you'd like to see next. Thank you so much for being here.